Hello and welcome to Church at Home. Whether it's your first time exploring faith, whether you're just new to us, or whether you're a regular at Maybridge just tuning in online, we're really glad you're here. My name is Chloe and I'm part of the staff team here at Maybridge Community Church. Do say hi in the comments, jump, tell us what you uh, liked about the service so far, it's great to hear from you. Um, like and subscribe to not miss out on any of our other church content and resources. And also, if you would like to give as part of your worship, you can do so by visiting maybridge.org.uk forward slash give or by scanning the QR code on the screen using the Give app. But of course, there's absolutely no pressure to give. Uh, this is something that Christians do as part of our worship. It's our way of acknowledging that uh, everything from Jesus is a gift and we want to partner with him and we're just excited to be part of the work that he's doing in the church, in the community and beyond. But like I say, there's no pressure to uh, join in with that or any other part of today's service for that matter. We're just really glad you're here with us trying it out and we hope you enjoy. Let our praise, let our praise be your welcome. Let our song Cause we are here for you We are here for you Let your breath come from heaven Fill our hearts with your life Cause we are here for you We are here for you To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. Let your shout be your anthem, be your Skies, cause we are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what stands come to life. Cause we are here for you. We are here for you. are open, nothing here is hidden, you are one desire, you alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down to you, to you our hearts are open. Let your fire fall down. Let your fire fall down. Let your fire fall down. We welcome you. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you. Well, hi, I'm Matt, one of the leaders at Maybridge. 
and every Sunday we look at the Bible because we believe God speaks to us through it, has the power to change us at the deepest level, and at the moment we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew, which is sort of like a biography of Jesus' life, but on steroids. It's amazing. And what I love about the passage we're going to read today is that it goes from some big stuff about Jesus right down to the everyday. Sometimes you read stuff that Jesus says or does and you think, wow, that, that's great, but it, it seems a long way from what my life looks like right now. How do, how do I relate to this? But today we'll see Jesus dealing with something that I think every one of us has experienced. And so he can relate to us and we can relate to him very clearly. So here we are. Matthew 13 from verse 51, for those that like to know these things. And this is where Jesus has just finished talking about the kingdom of heaven, a big name, but basically meaning where God's kingness is on display in the lives of his people or in, in the way that he does things. And uh, he said some mind-bending stuff, but before anybody can take a breath, Jesus says, have you understood all these things? Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Jesus is in this moment speaking to his disciples, his closest followers. They're a ragtag bunch of fishermen and political activists and tax collectors. And he's coming to into land after teaching some incredible things about the nature of God. This was powerful stuff. Nobody had heard anything like, this, anything like this before. And he finishes by saying, have you understood all of these things? Yes, they reply. I'm not sure I would have been so confident to say yes. But then Jesus says this line about being the owner of a house. And this is one of those ideas of Jesus that if you don't stop for a moment, you can just carry on by. It doesn't immediately sound very exciting. But wait. At this time, the teachers of the law were priests and Pharisees and Sadducees. And these were trained people, the professionals, the knowledgeable, highly educated, highly respected leaders and influencers. Everybody in the country looked to them to have insight. At a time when not everybody had a Bible and most people couldn't read, the teachers of the law were like walking Old Testament. They were the go-to place to learn about God and they knew it. And so what Jesus says here about a disciple of the kingdom, in other words, a person who followed him, was remarkable. In a roundabout way, he's saying, the key to understanding the Bible is me. If you're a disciple of me, you're actually better positioned to see what's happening through the Bible than these professional guys over here. You will have new treasures as well as old, new insights. This is quite a thing to claim. The implication is that everything the Bible says, everything God communicates through it, it's actually about Jesus. And it only makes sense if you see it as being about him. It adds colour to what was just black and white. And if you don't see that Jesus is the person that all the Old Testament points to, then it's a lot ri less rich and less exciting. It's got loads of fun stories, sure, but those stories, stories easily end up just being sort of nice moral tales or standards to live, to live up to or people to be inspired by. And that, that's all well and good. But if the Old Testament's really about Jesus, then suddenly it comes to life on a whole new level. All the big heroic characters are just foretastes of what he will do. All, all the standards we can't live up to stop being oppressive and just become reminders of what Jesus does do for us. Let me give an example. In Jewish thinking, the greatest teacher of all was Moses, who appears early in the Old Testament. And they absolutely love Moses. They can't get enough of him. And he's, he's great. He's a humble man that God uses. And you can take lots of inspiration from his life. Absolutely. But on his own, Moses just gives you a load of things to do better. When the teachers of the law taught about Moses, they would basically say something along the lines of, Moses said this and did this, now you go and do this and this. And it wasn't bad stuff. But a disciple of Jesus would be able to say, yes, Moses is amazing, everything he teaches is phenomenal, his example is wonderful. But all those things were marker points and arrows towards Jesus, who does all the Moses stuff, but greater. Moses led the people out of Egypt. That's like how Jesus led people out of sin. Moses taught people how to live. Jesus lives it on our behalf. Jesus died, and Moses died before his people got to the promised land. Jesus died so that his people could reach a promised land. Do you see how suddenly all these stories can now be three-dimensional and richer than they ever were before? That's what you get as a disciple of Jesus. You might not feel that way. You might think, oh, my, my knowledge of the Bible really isn't that good. And honestly, I, I feel the same. But the heritage that you and I have and the sense that Jesus is the whole point of the whole thing is unlocked for every follower of him. So when we do look at the Bible, 
it can speak to us on a whole different level. The, the bigger story has changed because of him. So this is an amazing promise. And, and Jesus does, through it, say something enormous about himself. But then let's look at what happens next. And I'm glad of what we've just looked at and how it gives us a contrast to what's coming. Because sometimes it's tempting to think that Jesus lives in this sort of slightly unreal world where everything goes to plan and he, he never comes across anything difficult until he ends up on the cross. And that's just not the case. Look at what happens next. This is from verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So Jesus is back in his hometown. His hometown was Nazareth. Nazareth was a fairly unspectacular little place in the north of Israel, not too far from the Sea of Galilee. And you might be surprised to know it was not considered a fashionable place. It was more Bogner than Brighton. In fact, there was even a saying, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I suspect, but I don't know for sure, that Nazareth was the sort of place that if you were getting above your station, people would let you know about it. And so when Jesus returns home, he gets a reaction, and it's not a good one. This is the bit of the passage that I think we can all relate to, every one of us, because I think all of us have had that experience of people saying to us, you don't belong doing what you're doing, that, that we're not good enough somehow, that we're too small, too insignificant to be who we are or what we're doing in some way. I personally know that voice is always in the back of my mind. Like Jesus, I'm from an unfashionable northern town. That might be my only similarity to him. Uh, I was born in Blackpool. A lot of my family are from around that area. And I've had many, many moments where in the back of my head, a voice sort of says, you're just Matt Wormsley from Blackpool. Who are you to do this or that or the other? You're nobody. I wonder if you felt that sort of way as well. Well, let's look at what they said specifically to Jesus and how he responds. Firstly, the crowd question the source of his wisdom and teaching. Very simply, they say, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't that incredible? They don't say, wow, Jesus, you've got super wisdom and miraculous powers. No, their instinct is to question whether it's valid. Who are you to have these things? The underlying belief is, Jesus, you're not special enough to have these things. You can't have earned them. There must be something illegitimate going on here. We can't put our finger on what it is. Nobody has ever missed the point as much as the people of Nazareth. But secondly, they question his class background. Now, in our culture, we, we talk about, or historically, we have talked about people being perhaps upper class or, or middle class or working class. And we might have ideas about what those terms mean. And most cultures have something like that going on. In Jesus' culture, as we just touched on, the people who taught with wisdom or taught wisdom were generally more middle class. They, they were educated, more likely to be able to read, a little bit wealthier. But Nazareth was a working class village. Jesus is described as the carpenter's son. How, how could he possibly do anything special? He's of the wrong stock. His family makes stuff out of wood. How could they possibly produce someone who understands the mysteries of God and does miracles? I wonder if that's ever happened to you. That because of your background, whether it's race or class or family or reputation, whatever, people have presumed you to be inadequate or inferior in some way. Well, here's a reminder. It happened to Jesus. He can relate. But then thirdly, they question his family credentials. Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Now these things are all true, but this was a way of saying, we've got your number, Jesus. We know your mum. We know your siblings. We saw you grow up. We remember you when you were six. We remember you when you had your bar mitzvah. We know all of your family and we know that none of them are special at all. So who are you? Who are you to come back into town like you're a big deal? Get back to the workshop. Now, in each case, their objections to Jesus are not logical, they're emotional. We don't know the source of your greatness. We do know your background. We know your family. These are not clever objections to who he is. These are fear-based reactions. Now, look at that summary where it just says, and they took offence at him. Isn't that the most 21st century reaction? They took offence at him. Jesus came into town teaching with wisdom, 
miraculously healing people, and they took offence at him. That's not how you're meant to react to Jesus. He's done nothing wrong. And yet the crowd belittles his identity, his roots, his family, and they take offence. Now think for a moment how would you would normally respond if this happened to you. And I bet that this has happened to you in some way because that's the world that we live in. At some point in life, and possibly lots of points, someone will have been offended by you because you didn't fit their box. You, you didn't do what they thought you should. Maybe you showed yourself to be good at something or capable of something and, and they didn't like it. And it might not have been communicated with words, but it was there. And people react in all different ways, of course. Some people would respond by coming out fighting. No, give me a chance. I'll, I'll prove myself. I'll show myself to you. And for many of us, we spend our whole lives doing that. We, we try to prove ourselves, often to people who we don't even like or maybe even ever see. But they're in our heads. We fear that they're right, that we really are worthless. And so we strive to make sure that's not true through our success and our achievements. Other people would respond with resigned sadness. We decide the accusations are true and we give up. We live with low self-worth and as the years go by we become comfortable with staying in the background, offending nobody and letting people, even loved ones, treat us like we don't matter. And in the cold light of day we know that neither of those approaches is very good but it's what we do. Look at how Jesus responds. He says one line but it's, it's very significant and it speaks to who he is and how we could respond to the accusations that the world throws at us too. He simply says, a prophet is not without honour except in his own town and his own home. A prophet is not without honour except in his own town and his own home. One line, but it packs in a lot. How does Jesus respond to this tidal wave of belittling? The first thing he does, which seems strange, is he identifies with the Old Testament prophets. For hundreds of years, Israel had had prophets, people who, who spoke up for God to the people, and they were often very unpopular because they said strong things, even to the point of being executed. And he's saying, I'm in that group. I'm one of them. Now, we know with hindsight that Jesus is more than a prophet, but he is also a prophet. He's the ultimate prophet. But one part of his response is to say, it's not just me that you do this to. You do this to every prophet. and I, I'm not alone in facing the negativity of the people. And that's quite a good example for us when we face the same sort of thing. You're not the only person who's felt how you feel when your validity is questioned, when you're belittled. There is a strange comfort to be found in knowing that it's happened to others, that it's a shared experience with more people than you might think. The second thing is, Jesus identifies a prophet's own town and own home as where the problem lies. They're the exception. The one place a prophet or anyone should feel secure is, is among their own people, their town, their family. But often it's one place they don't. Elsewhere, the prophet finds recognition, they, they find honour. But the, there is something about being amongst those you grew up with that can mean you face more criticism and more negativity than you do somewhere else. Because people think they've got your number. They think knowing your family and your upbringing means that you can't ever be more than the sum of those things. But often when you step out of those familiar places and the people that know your history, then you don't hear quite the same messages. It's a sad thing that I've observed in Christian ministry, how many people have family members or, or even married to somebody who belittles them and speaks negatively. And when that voice is so close, it can seem like it's true. But as soon as they step out of that situation, they find that they're honoured or valued by pretty much everybody else. And so what Jesus does is put the negativity into context. It doesn't come from everywhere. It comes from this point in particular. These people and their voices are loud. And in the same way, when we face negativity and suspicion, even from people who really shouldn't be doing it, we should step back and put it in context. Who's saying this? How many people is it actually? Is there another place where actually I am honoured and valued as a person? And what Jesus models is a way of responding to the belittling of others that is not fighting for approval and it's not running away from negativity, but it's setting the attacks in context. He doesn't argue, he doesn't complain, he just gives some context to what's going on. He steps back and thinks about what's happening. Now what I've just done is try to show how Jesus gives an example for responding when we're disrespected in a particular way. And we certainly can, I think, use him as a model. But here's the thing. We are not always the people who are in the Jesus position in the story. We'd like to think we are, and that tends to be the stuff we, that we remember when other people have, have slighted us and been critical of us. We're all very aware of that. However, we're often also the people that do the belittling, and we tend to be much less self-aware of that. Every one of us, I'm sure, has written off or dismissed or felt superior to somebody because of their 
perceived legitimacy, their background, their family, their race, their credentials. And we've probably done it lots and lots of times and we just don't remember. But more than that, just like the people of Nazareth in the story, we do the same thing to Jesus. Whether you're a militant atheist or you've been a Christian for decades, the truth is that actually all of us in our own ways belittle Jesus in our minds. Jesus, how could I possibly do what you say? I know what's best. You're a great teacher, Jesus, but nothing more. Jesus, when you give me what I want, I'll follow you. I'm, I'm happy for you to be the boss in a lot of my life, but don't touch my money or my free time or, or my attitude to that annoying bloke who lives next door. You know that feeling you hate when someone belittles you? You do that to him. And yet even though you and I don't have the wisdom of God or miraculous power, even though we're just normal people, he responds by honouring us and does not belittle us. He could, and that would be completely reasonable, but he doesn't. Look at the last line of the passage. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Sometimes people read that and think it means Jesus couldn't do any miracles because of the faith of the people was some sort of battery that powered his miracles. And that's not true. Actually, I think Jesus didn't do any miracles because he respects human dignity like nobody else. They didn't want him. They wanted to be independent of him. He doesn't throw his toys out the window. He doesn't zap them with bolts of lightning. He steps back. He respects their wishes. These are the actions of someone who respects, not belittles. And he's like that with us. Despite our limitless ability to reject and belittle Jesus in his work and in his person, we are outmatched by his limitless ability to graciously and patiently deal with us and somehow extend endless love to us while honouring us in all things. That's why it is good news that the Bible is really about him and not us, as we saw at the beginning. So as we finish, I want to ask you to do uh, one thing. And as, as soon as this, this, this service is over, grab a little bit of paper and a pen and write two things on it. Firstly, what is the most belittling message you felt you've received in life? It's quite a personal thing. It could be something from a parent, a teacher, a spouse, a number of people. What's the message that's been given to you that you felt has been belittling? Write it down. One reason Jesus died is to set you free from messages like that. He loves you. He values you. That's the truth. Secondly, where are you aware, aware that you belittle Jesus in your life right now? Write that down too. See what comes to mind first or what you naturally want to avoid thinking about. It's probably important. When you've written these things, draw a big cross over them. On the cross, Jesus dealt with your and my belittling of him amongst many other things. So draw a cross over it and then throw it away. And just to be clear, you don't have to do this, of course. It's just helpful for people to do symbolic stuff sometimes. And if you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus... You might not have thought about this before and you might have heard different bits and pieces about Jesus, but this gets to the heart message. This is not about religious ceremonies. This is about a God who knows what we're like, who's experienced what we're like, and invites us to hang every bad thing about ourselves on the cross that Jesus died on because he loves us, he wants to have a relationship with us, and he wants to change us for the better in both the darkest and most damaging things in our inner lives. Let me pray. Father, thank you for what your son Jesus did on the cross. Thank you that even though we belittle others and we belittle you and we all know the hurt of being belittled by others ourselves, thank you that Jesus deals with a whole lot and that with him we can move forward, we can be changed. Our hurts can be moved on from, the hurt that we do, the damage that we do, we can say sorry for and move on from and thank you that we can journey towards you together. Amen. Faith can move the mountains. Faith can move the mountains. Let the mountains move. And we come in expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation, but still you know my heart, the author of salvation, love me from the start, waiting here for you. And it's 
Thanks for watching. If you have any questions about what you've heard or anything at all for that matter, you can get in touch at info at maybridge.org.uk. We'd love to hear from you. If you're new to Faith, it'd be brilliant uh, if you wanted to come along to our next Alpha course so you can explore life's big questions. Or if you're just new to us and you'd like to find out more um, and you want to get it connected in at Maybridge, let us make you dinner and get to know you. Um, we'd love to see you at our next newcomers meal. You can sign up for both of those things and also find out more about church life, groups, special events, anything and everything uh, to do with the world of Maybridge Community Church uh, by heading to maybridge.org.uk. We hope to see you soon.